we can open the First Corinthians nine this morning. Is that a first song we sang? That last part of the first verse says, "Jesus doeth all things well." We know that He is God, so of course He does all things well. But in Matthew, or in, excuse me, Mark seven thirty-seven. After He had healed this man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, it says that, that the people there were astonished. They were beyond measure astonished, saying he had done all things well. And he had. Certainly, he does all things well. First Corinthians 9, and we'll go for our Sunday school lesson. Oh, Brother Bergman the past way, he was down there, right where Brother Ken is from. Mm -hmm. Remember, he said their, their church is fellowship together. <laughs> uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I'd like to look at this topic here that I think we, we don't think much about today, and I think every last one of us are lacking. He's talking about running a race and winning a prize in the previous verses and fighting a fight. And then verse 27, we'll take our text from here. It says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Mm -hmm. It's bringing this body or this flesh into subjection is what I'd like to talk about today. He said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. That literally means he, he beats his body, he afflicts it, he wears it down. Mm -hmm. his, left, his flesh left to itself will run wild. I say right. That. For the child of God, we are to bring it into subjection. He says he keeps under his body, or he, like I said, he afflicts it, he wears it down and brings it into subjection. That means he disciplines it. He, Really, to the point that it is in subjection, that it's enslaved, you could say. Just like we see pictures of slavery, I know they're not all accurate, but you can, slaves being beaten into submission. That's really the picture that Paul is saying here we have to do with our flesh. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying we should go get up a whip and whack ourselves on the back, but we are to bring this body into subjection. Mm -hmm. yeah. Reign it in, if you will. Amen. Because yes, we are, we may be saved, but if we just let our flesh do what it wants, it will run rampant in sin. You're right. And that's exactly what the world does, though. They have no desire, no reason in themselves to reign into subjection, other than maybe a little bit of conscience. Mm -hmm. You have this theory of just do what feels good, do what makes you happy, do what you want to do today. Mm. But that's not what we should be doing as the children of God. Right. Luke 9 23 tells us, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Mm -hmm. It'll take up the cross as a burden in and of itself. But he says first we have to deny ourselves. I mean, we have to deny ourselves the things we, we want, things as flesh desires. Really, we have to deny ourselves of self honor and pride. Mm -hmm. We'll get to some of that here a little bit later in our lesson, but denying ourselves isn't taught very much today, is it? Right. That we're put. Really, God first and foremost, and even then others before our own selves. Well, we are not to seek out the fulfilling of the desires of this flesh. Yet, so many professing Christians today, that's exactly what they do. Mm -hmm. There seems to be no, no sorrow over sin much anymore. But As Brother Pink said, that's what separates true believers from empty professors. Amen. Well, I've, 
I've learned of one thing, if nothing else, here in recent times that this flesh isn't as good as we like to think it is. You're right. Uh, you know, we in of ourselves like to think we're an okay person, but this flesh is much more sinful than we want to give it credit for. You're right. I know we, we put on our our best when we come to church, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, but we fool ourselves that we think we're really good in the, our flesh. Amen. So Paul said in another place, let him that think he standeth take heed lest he fall. We'll get to that in a moment, we get to pride, but we ought not to think too highly of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, in, back in 1 Corinthians again in chapter 6, Paul writes for us in verse number 20. It says, For ye are bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Mm -hmm. So, the child of God, our objective ought to be to glorify God first and foremost. He says both in our body and in our spirit, because they belong to God. Mm -hmm. well, does it mean we are to, we're not free to do what we want to, as the world would teach? Yes, we have liberty in Christ, but we're not to use that liberty for an occasion for the flesh, Paul said. No, we are bought with a price. He said, literally, Christ died for us mm -hmm. to buy us back from sin, and yet we often are guilty of thinking, well, I'll do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And we ought to have our chief aim to glorify God. You know, there's this uh, teaching out in the world that you know, this is my body, I'll do with it what I want to, but the child of God, that's not so. Amen. It's not ours to paint up like a canvas or to poke holes in it or to Amen. put it on display. Amen. No, it's even this body is to be used for the glory of God. Right. That's just one of the reasons why we need to bring in subjection. Because it in and of itself the flesh doesn't want to glorify God. That's it. No. Second Peter two twenty two Peter says, it's happened on them according to the true proverb that the sow that was washed has returned to her wallowing in the mire and the dog returned to his vomit. Yeah. The flesh left to itself will do exactly that, won't it? You're right. Amen. That's why those who make a false profession often go right back to the sin which they came from, at least in time. That's it. But even the child of God from that if we don't bring this flesh into subjection here, that it will go right to sin as well. well the sow of the pig, you can bring it in, you can wash it up, you can, you can even paint its toenails and put some makeup on it, and yet you let it go and it's going to go right back to that's the it. mud. Amen. Because that's what it loves by nature. Just like this flesh loves sin by nature. Mm -hmm. Just one more reason why we need to bring it into subjection, because if not, it will go right to sin. That's it. Romans chapter 6, we'll turn over there. Romans 6, verse 12 says, let not sin therefore reign your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Amen. You know, we, we don't like to say we have a choice, but we do have a choice in serving God. Mm -hmm. Letting sin reign in our bodies. Certainly we cannot eradicate it completely from this flesh, but he says we are not to let it reign or to have just free course and control in our lives. Mm -hmm. That you should obey in the lust thereof. So we don't have to let sin just run its course and do what it wants to do. We don't have to let this flesh just 
do whatever feels good to it. Mm -hmm. Yep. We often do because that's what's more enjoyable, isn't it? Right. It's more enjoyable to, to feel the pleasure of sin than it is to weary down our flesh that it won't want to sin. To discipline it so that it doesn't sin. He said that you should not, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Lust always leads to sin. James 1.15 tells us, Lust when it is conceived, bring it forth sin. Sin when it is finished, bring it forth death. <coughs> Leads us to sin, and sin always breeds more and more sin. Yeah. Well, I'm always reminded of that song: "Sin will take you farther than you want to go, mm -hmm. keep you longer than you want to stay, and will cost you far more than you want to pay." One thing we, even as, or I say, oftentimes Christians of ours, acting as just a little bit of sin won't hurt us. Or we can dabble in just a little bit, and we'll get out and be okay. The problem is when the flesh gets a taste of that sin once more. It's not satisfied with just a little bit. But kind of like, at least me, I'm going to watch all of them. You get some good dessert or something, you want more, don't you? Yeah. If you were to let the flesh do what it wanted, it would probably eat until you had a belly ache. But yet, it's the same way with sin. The flesh gets a little taste and it wants more and more and it will eat its full of it. Yeah. That's why we are not to obey the lust in another. Let's turn over to uh, 1 John. Look at, I guess, the three of the major areas which we need to bring this flesh into subjection. 1 John chapter 2. I'm sure a familiar verse. First John 2 16. After he tells us to love not the world, he says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not the Father, but is of the world. Amen. He says, The lust of the flesh. That's things which the flesh enjoys. You know, oftentimes for today it's things such as possessions and money. Mm -hmm. uh, it can also be things such as drunkenness, just things that bring sinful pleasure to this flesh. We are not to follow after those things. Mm -hmm. Romans 13, 14, I, I can't quite quote that for us, but it just says not to make provision for the flesh. Amen. Romans 13, 14, he says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Mm -hmm. So first, the answer to sin is always Christ. Mm -hmm. For the unsaved and for the saved alike, it's not anything that we can do, but we must, as he says here, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In him we can conquer sin, if you will. Mm -hmm. so in and of ourselves, we will not be able to do that. We are not strong enough. But he says, make, no, make not provision for the flesh, or don't give the flesh opportunity Amen. to fill the lust thereof. You know, we trick ourselves once again as thinking if we can just put ourselves in this situation and we'll, that we'll be able to withstand. Mm. This flesh is not near as strong as we can give it as we think it is. You're right. Amen. In fact, Matthew 26, verse 41, Christ said the flesh is, spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Mm. Amen. In fact, he told us to watch and pray that you enter not into temptation because of those things. Seeking God and in prayer is one of the best remedies for temptation. Because this flesh is not going to 
just rejects sin on its own. You're right. Amen. It's not going to save. That looks pretty good. I think I'll just pass. <laughs> exactly. In fact, we'll turn there just a second and see. That's exactly what it does. It looks on it and wants it. But <laughs> when this flesh desires something, we don't bring that in control, it'll run right after that. No matter what that sin may be, we ought not to think that we are above any sin. That's it. Amen. I ought to remind of David, described as a man after God's own heart, yet he took that to be wife and then had Uriah killed. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, sin always leads to more sin. He had to cover up his sin, so he sinned again. That's it. Sin always just breeds more and more until mm -hmm. you might think, well, I got away with that. If you're going to eventually get found out. As right. Moses said to the Israelites, be sure your sin will find you out. That's it. I'm always reminded of that when you think of secret sins, that one day they'll find you out. Let's go back to the first John where we're at in chapter two. We'll just, after he says the lust of the flesh, he says and the lust of the eyes. You might be thinking what's the difference, but these are things that we look upon and are enticed by. So, one example for us men especially is to look upon another woman and the lust after her, commit adultery in our hearts. That's it. Amen. That's a very prevalent one in our day. There's lots of things that we can look upon and lust after. You don't have to have necessarily good eyesight either to follow <laughs> this thing. Right. Let's turn. Well, we don't have to even turn there, really. But I think we all know Genesis 3, verse 6, where Eve saw the tree that was good for food, that was pleasant to the eyes. Mm hmm. That was the, that's this lust of the eyes. She looked on and said, oh, it looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. I think I'll just take some. See, that's what the flesh does. She didn't say, oh, it looks pretty good, but God said I can't eat of it. <laughs> right. So, left to ourselves, we'll do exactly like Eve. Mm -hmm. And even worse, as Adam, and not even do it in... Be and be God was do it willingly. Mm -hmm. So I know we get down on Eve for taking it, but Adam, he knew exactly what he was doing. For sure. sure. But, and yet, then, yeah. if we were honest with ourselves, we'd do the same thing. And the lust of the flesh and the lust of eyes, the eyes are two things we need to watch out for. In fact, David in Psalms 101, verse 3, he says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Amen. Because David realized that to set that before him would just lead him to lust and eventually to sin. Mm -hmm. um, and we are deceiving ourselves if we think we're any better than he was. Mm -hmm. That we can look upon all this sin and not be affected by it. We can look... And you'll be entertained by wickedness and think that we're pleasing God. Yet we so often do such things. Mm -hmm. so instead of lot that is seen and hearing, it vexed his righteous souls. We can know the sin of Sodom. Yet we have to be in the world, but we don't have to look upon their sins, if you will. We don't mm -hmm. have to be entertained by their wickedness. Get the flesh gets a lot of enjoyment out of that, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. In that. <coughs> I don't think anyone here watches Days of Our Lives or General Hospital or any of those type of shows, but the flesh just laps that stuff up, doesn't it? All right. You know, it's not hard to turn on just about any TV show and see similar type situations nowadays. Mm -hmm. We ought to be careful what we set before us and what we take into our lives. If we feed 
the flesh wickedness, we can expect it to produce wickedness. That's it. Amen. That goes back to our original text that we need to deny ourselves, as Luke said, we need to bring this body in subjection to, to discipline it. Mm -hmm. You know, we might have to skip over some enjoyments in this life and things that we might think nothing of that we might live a more holy and righteous life before God. Mm -hmm. The last thing John is here is the pride of life. We have a problem with pride in this country at least. Amen. Not, not even just the the alphabet crew, whatever you want to call it, LGBTQI plus <laughs> now. Yeah, you know, they're very proud of their sins, but we are going to be very proud of ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. We seek the praise and notoriety of men. That's this pride of life that he's speaking of here. Right. James says that he, that God resists or he opposes the proud, but gives grace in the humble. Mm -hmm. Matthew and, or excuse me, Christ in Matthew 23, verse 12 says that whosoever exalts himself shall be humbled. And God doesn't take any pleasure in pride, and we ought not to seek to be lifted up by the praise of men. That's it. Nothing wrong with encouraging one another in the flesh, but when we receive encouragement, we're not careful. This flesh will be boasted up in it. Mm -hmm. I'd say most people think Brother Larry's a pretty good preacher. He could say to himself, yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm better than that other fellow over there. Mm. At that point, you taken what was supposed to be an encouragement to the Spirit and made it into something sinful. You're right. Amen. Yet that's exactly what flesh does. It likes to be lifted up, puffed up. It likes to be exalted. You're right. But for the child of God, we should only seek to exalt Christ and not ourselves. So let's turn back there to Matthew where I was mentioning because He's really calling out the hypocrisy of the Pharisees here once again, as he often is doing. Matthew 23. We'll go ahead and go to verse 1. It says, Then spake Jesus the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Call therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Right. The Pharisees had a problem with self righteousness and self pride. Mm hmm. And they said, well, look, thus, do what we say to do. And Christ said they were telling them to do the right things, but they weren't doing them things themselves. Yet they thought they were very righteous in themselves, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Well, I think they are not as an extortioner or adulterer or, or even as this publican. That, mm -hmm. that was the one's prayer. Right. That is that pride in the flesh at what we can do and what we aren't. If you go, let's just kind of find a verse here. I don't, I don't see it now, but it said they, they sought out the, the highest seats in the temple, the, right. the chief seats, it says, that they might be seen of men. We, I don't think any of us are trying to sit right up in the front, but if we're not careful, we'll want to be seen in men. Mm -hmm. we? It was good to tell others about what the work that God is doing, but make sure it's about God and not about what you're doing. Amen. No, if we're not careful, we'll become just like the Pharisees. And, 
Cool. Our modern day thing as well. We have the truth that nobody else does, so we're better than them. Mm. I don't think any one of us would say that, but there's a whole lot of what Sovereign Grace Baptists that act that way. Right. Amen. Oh, the pride of life is something we ought to be very careful to avoid. But it takes disciplining this flesh because it likes to be lifted up. It likes to be exalted. That's why Paul says regarding salvation by works that it's not a works lest any man should boast mm -hmm. because man will boast about it. What he said. Done. Whether from salvation or to <coughs> our service for Christ, it all I point back to him and not to us. Mm -hmm. Pride will make us forget from whence we came. Mm -hmm. It will make us forget that it's God that makes us to differ. Make us forget that it's just by the grace of God that I am what I am. Amen. All well, pride will always lead to more and more sins. Just like the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. But we do have one promise. First John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Amen. That takes getting rid of pride also. The proud says, Well, I don't have any sins, or I'm okay. So if we were all honest, we say that to ourselves to some degree. Mm -hmm. But we probably won't come out and boldly say, well, I don't have any sin. But do we really compare ourselves regularly to God's word, his standard, and say, as Job, I am vile? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm reminded of, well, if you don't mind, I'm going to read something that John Newton, author of Amazing Grace, wrote. He wrote this letter. A little bit lengthy, but I think the whole thing is good. He says, regarding depravity and depravity within him own, his own self, he says, Dear friend, wickedness prevails and increases in our city to a dreadful degree. Our streets are filled with the sons of Belial who neither fear God nor regard man. I wish my heart was more affected with what my eyes see and my ears hear every day. Mm -hmm. I am often ready to fear lest the Lord should show his displeasure in some dreadful way. And surely if he were to strict all, or if you were strict to mark all that is amiss, I myself would tremble. Oh, were he to plead against me, I could not answer him one word. Alas, my dear friend, you know not what a poor, unprofitable, unfaithful creature I am. If you knew the evils which I feel within and the snares and difficulties which beset me from without, you would pity me indeed. Mm -hmm. So much forgiven, yet so little love to Jesus. So many mercies, yet so few returns. Such great privilege did a life so sadly below them. And this is the part that stuck out to me. He says, Indwelling sin presses me downward, and I would do good, evil is present with me. I can mm -hmm. attempt nothing, but it is debased, polluted, and spoiled by my depraved nature. My sins of omission are innumerable. In a word, there is much darkness in my understanding, much perverseness in my will, much disorder in my affection, much folly and madness in my imagination. In short, I'm a real to myself, a heap of inconsistencies. Mm. He goes on to say, Alas, when shall it be otherwise? I have a desire of walking with God, but I cannot attain unto it. Surely it is far better to part and be with Christ than to live here up to the ears in sin and temptation. Mm -hmm. But we have an attitude with the Father. Here my hope revives. Though wretched in myself, I am complete in Him. He is my wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. On this rock I build for time and eternity. Amen. We would do good to examine ourselves as John Newton did there. Mm -hmm. I think we would see we're not quite as good as we think we are. <coughs> well, but we do have that advocate with the Father, and if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And if you don't know Christ as Savior, then truly sin is running free in your life, whether you are outwardly sinning or inwardly sinning. You have no desire other than maybe conscience or pleasing parents or someone around you that to control that sin. Mm -hmm. Only Christ can give victory over sin. Well, how we ought to long look for the day when we have complete victory over it. 
when he returns, when we drop this sinful body and put on that one that's perfect, the one that's made like in his glory, <coughs> then we shall have that complete victory over sin. Amen. We're not long for that day when we ought to examine ourselves if we're really right with God. Mm. So, for the time being, as we try to serve God, we have discipline this flesh. We do, as he said, bring it into subjection. Mm -hmm. That we wouldn't let sin reign in our mortal bodies. Rather, we would use it for the glory of God. Amen. Let's close with that thought. Amen.